uh, I'll just uh, very quickly here show you behind me uh, what uh, uh, the talk uh, of today is about. Uh, Jeff is here to talk as, uh, to us about online education post-COVID. Uh, you know, when uh, when Elaine Tavares was uh, discussing some possibilities of online education a couple of uh, weeks ago, I think I mentioned that that was when I mentioned, you know, someone that we have to bring to talk to us was Jeff. And I thank him very much for at a short notice to include us. And uh, I mean, the, the great thing about Jeff is, is, is that this uh, Australian uh, Lord uh, has some Latin American blood on him. He, he does accept uh, last minute challenges. Uh, and when uh, when I told him about uh, uh, this, he said, sure, sure, I'll do. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I will very quickly, uh, a little more formally, introduce uh, Jeff to you. Jeff, uh, and, and, and here I'm just reading some of the, the stuff that is, is, is there in uh, St. John's University's website where he's uh, allocated right now. But Jeff has been all over the, the place. He's one of those nomad uh, scholars. Uh, uh, the other day he was telling me that his decision to move to the United States after a career as a uh, in, in education in, in Australia was uh, when his daughter moved to the to the States. Well, his daughter is back in Australia and he's still uh, in, in the States. I think uh, in his fourth university there, right? He's, he's, he has worked at uh, Dolan College, New York, and then uh, 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 at the Georgia Southern. That's, I think, when he was at Georgia Southern was when I first met him. Uh, and then uh, in the George Washington University, where he was uh, for for quite a while, for, for a little while, and then uh, Northern Arizona, and now he's back to New York. So I've already told him that whenever we have a chance after this pandemic, that's that's someone I want to visit. Uh, it's not all times that we 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 have a friend living right in Manhattan uh, that we can go visit just walking through that uh, great city. Uh, right. Uh, uh, I guess as I told you, uh, Jeff, we already have uh, our our crowd here. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, I appreciate the the introduction, and look, I, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come along and talk to you all uh, today. Um, I I prepared some slides. I don't know how wh whether you have a process for disseminating them or whatever. But Alex, if you would like them at some point, I'll I'll make them available uh, to you. If you, make them, uh, if you make them available to me, I can include them in the Moodle. We, we have a Moodle platform where uh, everyone ha can have access to it later. Okay. So again, thank you very much for the for the opportunity here. Um, I will uh, uh, just sort of continue on here unless unless you interrupt me, Alex, and ask for a question or uh, something, some message in the chat or whatever. Um, my understanding is that uh, the session runs for about an hour or so, and, and I will try and finish within 40 minutes or something like that, and then we can have a discussion. I sincerely hope that we do have a discussion, because what I have to say today is, I think, uh, my view of the world. And if you agree with me, we could certainly use some support in uh, what, I, what I would like to suggest to you. Let me go back a bit. It's it's uh, interesting for me to be talking about online education, because I, I've effectively been uh, some way involved with distance or online education almost my whole life. When I was growing up in Australia, we lived a long way from any uh, any city. In fact, we lived a long way from any small town. And we lived on a sheep station uh, way out in, uh, in central Queensland. And uh, I did my elementary school or primary school, as some of you would know it, uh, by by uh, correspondence, which was a form of distance education, where the lessons and so forth were sent out every um, every week, and and the uh, teacher was was my mother, uh, so she still corrects or still used to, before she died, she still used to correct some of my my English, uh, and uh, those uh, those old habits die hard. I I have then uh, pretty much since I started teaching uh, in in Australia. Uh, 30 years ago or so, I've always been involved with some form of online education. We started out by using Lotus Notes that some of you might remember. We posted CDs out to students. Uh, we, we, I ran a, a course in Georgia in the United States uh, from, from down, being down in Australia. And even more recently, uh, I've experimented uh, with some some MOOCs, uh, massive open online courses, by incorporating them into my own programs and have the students undertake them and so forth. And so there's lots of lots of examples, and and it's 
I guess I could say that online education has really been a, a big part of my, my life. Uh, then, of course, in, in about, what is it? Um, the calendar here on my wall is, is stuck at the date, February 2020, when, when everything changed. Uh, the calendar wasn't touched for about, uh, about 12 months or so. You can perhaps uh, see it behind me here, uh, still, still on um, February 2020. Uh, and the world really did change, and, and I guess we don't have, and these were some of the questions that, that sort of posed themselves to, to not just me, of course, but to my colleagues all around the world. And, and we, we really had no feeling for how long this would go on, uh, whether or not uh, it would pause and we'd have to do it again. That raised questions about, is this something that's going to last just for a semester, or should I put some really, really put some effort into this? and. Uh, make my classes more online than, than just face-to-face. Uh, -face. And, you know, how do, for many of us, the question was, how do I, do I even teach online? How do I, how do I go about this? Uh, so I, I think at least there is at least a possibility that either this will continue in some countries for some time, or uh, we may find ourselves, sadly, back in this position, either for an uh, a, a uh, development of that's currently related to the current pandemic or perhaps even a new one. So I thought what I would uh, uh, be able to say here might, might perhaps help um, a little bit with the answers to some of these questions and, and in particular, I guess, the, the last two there. So my, my objective today is talk, to talk a little bit about the way that I teach and, and some of the lessons that I've learned uh, then discuss sort of some of the problems that we face, not just as professors, but the whole education industry, if you like to use that word. And then I thought I'd try and pre pre uh, present to you some of my um, thoughts on what we can do and how we might be able to go about it. Now, as I say, if you agree, I'm, I'm just one voice, and I'd be very, I'd be very happy to hear from from you uh, as to your thoughts and so forth as to what's. Uh, what's possible or what's uh, reasonable or what's uh, even something that we should we should be doing uh, <coughs> excuse me I, I think the um, for me teaching in the pandemic was very very different um, than what I'd done before as I said to you I, I've been teaching online classes one way or another for 30 years but the really big difference uh, over the last two has been in that 30 years the students who were in my class were in the class because they wanted to be. Uh, they, they maybe heard about the class and thought this sounds interesting. Maybe the schedule fitted them. Maybe they were trying to squeeze in an extra class that they couldn't attend face to face. Maybe they really just did like the idea of, of taking their classes online. But in every one of those cases, the students were there, as I say, because they wanted to be. And for all of us for the last 18 months, two years, it's been the students have been there because they had to be there. They didn't choose my class because it suited their schedule or so forth. They were given little option uh, but to, to join it. And of course, we made this decision, probably for all the right reasons, but we still made this decision with no thought as to the student, the individual student's suitability for working this way. Uh, we certainly didn't think about things like their capability of managing their work and whether or not they had the resources necessary and so forth. Um, so the students, I think, for me at least, during this last 18 months, have been a de very different group to what I experienced um, beforehand. Some of the students were good. If, I, I'm, I'm lucky, right? I teach mostly, I teach seniors or some the final year students in their degrees. Uh, and by that stage, of course, they've really worked out what they need to do to finish. Uh, the, the problems area, I think, are the first years and the second years. Um, and we ha have another issue here, of course, is that this wasn't what they signed up for, right? They, they signed up to, to leave home, to make new friends, to become independent. And now they found themselves back in their childhood bedroom, uh, you know, working off a laptop with, with colleagues they couldn't see, uh, with the professor who was sometimes indifferent. Uh, Etc. So I think one of the things that I would really stress is that student engagement in not only in the pandemic, but in online classes generally, but particularly so in the pandemic, really does become all important. And I think to achieve that, 
we we need to find ways to improve our engagement with the students. We need to find ways to establish a rapport with the students. Um, we need to s make communications easy and uh, acceptable uh, for the students. The material we offer has to be seen as relevant, right? I, I have kind of long believed in the uh, axiom, I suppose, that to be successful in higher education, students need to have two of three things. And I know this sounds trite or even or even childish perhaps, but, but for me, it's a very simple way of stating it. I think the students need to be bright, they need to work hard, and they need to enjoy what they're doing. Any two of those will work. Now, we can't do too much about the first two perhaps, but we can certainly do a lot about the third one. We need to make the course material enjoyable, interesting, relevant to their material and so forth. Um, one of the ways that uh, I've, I've been able to do this, and I'm sure there are many, many ways that we can do it, but one of the ways is uh, I will often ask students to give me feedback uh, on, on an email before I send it out, or perhaps on a short presentation or a model or something that I'm going to use. Do you understand this? What's it say to you? This kind of thing. And they'll come back to me with, uh, with suggestions, and that gives them a very strong investment uh, in the course. We need to find ways to humanize the professor. We need to uh, not be just a, a, a voice or a picture at the, at the end of a Zoom meeting, rather like we're doing here, perhaps. So we need, we need to find ways to make the material relevant, the professor caring. We need communications that will fit the students. If you use email, uh, well, you better answer it pretty promptly. Students usually expect an answer right away. Um, I've had messages, uh, you know, at 10 o'clock at night and then another one at 2 a.m. It seems you didn't get my earlier message. Um, now, that's an exaggeration, of course, or at least a one-off, but uh, those, that sort of expectation is there. Another way that we can do this that, that some students I've found really appreciate, that if, if you can make a comment that shows you're taking an interest in their own work, that is a tremendous a boost to this idea of student engagement. For example, I might comment if a student writes a paper, I might comment that he, you know, while well, the paper was fine, but, you know, he had a poor writing style. He needs to break it up more, reduce the length of his sentences, use paragraphing, white space, etc. And then the next time he turns one in, I'll try and remember to comment on any improvements that I see in those areas by saying, I like this a lot better than your last one, uh, etc. Thanks for taking on board what you did. And that sort of longevity, I suppose, involved with the, uh, with the um, uh, uh, students and engagement with the course, uh, it all goes to ways to having the students uh, want to be there and, and, and hopefully uh, enjoy what they're doing. The, the learning management system, and I, I think I've taught on all of these uh, over, over the years, um, and a couple more that perhaps are not there. Um, I think that one of the issues here is that if we're going to use the learning management system and, and in the and in this sort of environment, this really was the interaction with the student. First of all, we need to try and try and decide on one. Some universities actually use several uh, and leave it and that leave it up to the university professors to do their own thing on on various different types. That's kind of confusing. But I try and use the LMS as a way of giving the students uh, access to everything they need for the course. Their quizzes are there, their tests are there, their presentations are there, their assignment work is submitted there, any readings are there, all of that stuff, everything except perhaps the uh, perhaps the textbook. Now the LMS I think comes with uh, sort of the good, the bad and the ugly here for those of you who are old enough to rem remember the film. And I tried to make, I tried to sort of uh, identify some of the things here that, that work well and some of the things that uh, perhaps are problematic. I think being consistent is good, and I just don't, I don't just mean in our course, but consistent across the, uh, across the um, university or at least the program that the students are involved in. Uh, here, where I am at the moment, we actually switched LMSs uh, over the last couple of years, and for the first 18 months of that, it was voluntary as to whether we changed or not. So the students, most students, had to deal with at least two uh, of the LMS systems. Um, so being consistency is good. 
if we're going to use the announcement sy systems in the LMS, we need a way of uh, making sure that students can easily identify any new amount announcements. I, for example, put them in red so that the students can see. And then, of course, you have to go in and change them back to black when, when they're no longer new. I put, as I've already said, I put everything in the LMS. And a lot of the LMSs provide you with a bunch of statistics that if you figure them out, they can be quite useful in terms of uh, student interaction, who's taking, who's turning up, who's spending time there, who's not doing that, etc. So they're the good things. Uh, the bad things are really cluttered pages that the students struggle to, to get any sense out of. Really big files. I, I tend to keep my presentations quite short. Remember that students in uh, all over the world will have varying access to presentations and, the, and having to stream a 40 minute video or download a huge file is simply impossible for, for some uh, students with their connections. The LMSs have a student view. Uh, I, I, what I do, I don't trust the student view. It usually doesn't do exactly, it doesn't look exactly like what the student does. So I usually find a student and set up a, a exercise like this uh, to um, have the student share his or her screen with me for a few minutes so I can see what things look like. And again, that's a way of getting the students involved and helping in the program. And uh, if we're going to change things, we better be very careful. Many students, for example, print off the syllabus at the beginning of the term or the schedule and uh, never go back to looking at the, at the online version. Uh, so try to keep any changes to, to, a, uh, to a minimum. And some of the ugly things, really long presentations, no one's going to sit and listen to you droning on for an hour or more. Uh, if you don't have a kind of read first, how do I get started? That's not a good thing. Office hours are office hours are dubious. I, I I usually set office hours, but hardly anybody ever turns up. Most students prefer to communicate uh, just quickly via text message or or an email, and it's also not a good thing to just you know be putting your stuff up one day ahead of the students. It's good to let them know that you're committed to it and you've thought about it a bit and so forth. Uh, the the unknown most most of you probably now use weekly modules. Um, I think that. I, I really didn't like weekly modules. I used to use the LMS for uh, in parts, presentations, tests, readings, etc. Uh, but I do agree that it certainly helped the students over this last uh, period of time to have their week for the work, uh, week for the work, the work for the week, all set uh, together. Um, class discussions. We uh, we can use them for frequently asked questions, but no one will look at them after the first two or three weeks. Uh, I always try and post a summary of the discussions. One of the things that I do there is if I have a large class, more than about six or eight, I break it into groups and have the students post the summaries and make someone a, uh, a group leader for that week where they summarize the material for their small group. You need to be pretty specific about what you want and, and I think um, uh, you could think about stopping them being able to see others' posts before they put their own. Um, it's not a replication of the classroom. It's not going to work in the sense that a classroom discussion does, where the students will build off each other and argue and so forth. So you can't really expect that. Uh, probably not a good idea to allow for late submission. Once you allow for late submission, everybody turns in work late. Uh, you, most times these involve some sort of a grade and you probably need to figure out ahead of time how you're going to do that. And it's important that the students don't see them as just, look, I haven't thought of anything better for you to do this week, so I'm going to give you a discussion. Uh, the re discussion really needs to be related and seen to be related to something to develop the learning material. Group work for us, right? It's meaningful and realistic. It's a preparation for the workforce. It enables team building and maybe even it it, uh, it means we don't have to do as much grading. For students, they have to work with people they don't know. The communications problems are greatly exacerbated. Uh, the students have different expectations. I was talking to one of my students yesterday who was complaining about one of her members. She's aiming for an A in the class. He's aiming for a D at best. Um, so she felt that that was pretty unfair, that uh, he, he simply wasn't interested in putting in the amount of work, not, not that she's, not that this is in my class, but she was just uh, raising this issue about how students do have different expectations, and that's, and that's quite true. Uh, it's hard to control work between group members, 
and and the flow of that work and how do they deal with the people who are non non conforming so all of those things i think go to some uh go to some um identify some of the problems that students see with something that, that we tend to build into most of our courses students do have a very different view of it so what to do about group work? Well, I, I would suggest you keep it to a minimum. Think about as ways of assigning students to groups. It's usually random, but but perhaps we can improve on that. Uh, set up some sort of get to know you exercise so the students can actually at least exchange phone numbers and so forth before they have to deal with each other through the LMS. Uh, I would allow multiple submissions of group work. Someone will always say, oh, so-and-so didn't get his work in in time. Um, can you put it in tonight? It'll be easier if you just uh, allow you only grade the latest, latest one, but give them like another day or so to make any final submissions. Think about whether peer review is appropriate. And uh, I, will, I usually threaten peer review, but uh, I very rarely have to uh, undertake it. And we really need a way for the groups to be reporting their progress so they don't fall too far behind. Uh, the second last area I want to talk about was, was ethics. Um, Somehow in an online environment, I in many cases feel closer to the students than I do in the face-to-face -face one, um, or some of the students. And it's particularly those who have communicated with me, who've come to me with a problem, who've uh, done something for me. And it's very easy to transgress here, I think. Um, we, uh, you know, a, a request for more time to turn something in or sympathetic to some internet interruption or technical issue without thinking that this might be affecting quite a number of others in the course. So I sort of, sort of have these set of rules for myself. Uh, I always try and try and be aware that of what I'm doing if I'm acting in a way that might be seen as favoring a student or a small group of students uh, or giving some advantages that I haven't given to others. I always try and document it. And even if it's just a note in a book to myself, in my, in my diary to myself of something that I did, and that forces me to think about the issue a bit more. And I usually talk to my colleagues, what, what do you do in this set of circumstances? I've got this problem, et cetera. So I think that the, I think ethics raises its head for me in a, in a kind of a surprising way here. Uh, the testing, this is a, a big problem and we're going to continue on about this a little bit. Um, the, certainly there is a perception that students cheat in one way or another, plagiarize, copy, get someone else to help them uh, in online classes more than others, more than face-to-face -face ones. I'm not sure that that is true. And indeed, the grades that I have given over the last 18 months for tests and so forth are similar to grades that I have given before that. So I'm not sure that that's true, but that's certainly a perception. And I think that's one of the major areas that we need to address. And I'll, I'll come to that in, in just a minute. But some of the ways in which you might at least figure out what's happening is by getting to know your students' work. You, if, if you, This works much better, I will admit, in small classes than big ones. If you know all your students and what they're capable of and they suddenly turn in something that doesn't look like them, you'll know pretty well that they, pretty well right away that they didn't write it. Think about taking home, take home style exams. Uh, in other words, to give them a paper and a weekend to address it kind of thing. Uh, some sort of acknowledgement. I usually put on my exit tests that are run this way that I, by taking this test, I acknowledge that I'm aware that this has to be my own work and there are severe penalties for uh, getting outside help, etc. We might have to think at some point about bringing students in for proctored exams, at least for some of them. Other things, we can make short time limits, which gives them limited time to look up material, but that has its own other disadvantages, particularly for people whose language is, first language is not the one you're teaching in. And of course, uh, random delivery is, is another one, and I usually do try and do that with uh, by building a sort of test bank of course questions and giving them to students uh, randomly, so at least they're not all working on the same same questions. But that brings me to the, I guess, what I really wanted to talk about today, and, and that's the uh, problems that we, uh, I think, that we're facing and we're seeing as facing through this um, through this last 18 months or so. The first one is that a perception that online is is somehow inferior, and I and I suspect that that's a little bit harsh, but it's certainly a perception out there, uh, not only for the inability to determine whether or not the student who's getting the credit actually did the work, 
but uh, perhaps the things like absence of networking, the ability to get together with their friends to make lifelong uh, colleagues and so forth, someone they can call on 20 years or 10 years later and say, uh, do you remember this or would you be interested in participating in that kind of thing? And I think also there's, there's certainly a gap there in the, in the interaction uh, with, with the professor. Um, I think perhaps some of the uh, universities have sought over the years to boost enrollment by promoting online classes without thinking too much about how they should run them. And on the other hand, you know, some, some classes that are not perhaps directly relevant to a major might lend themselves to this. I was talking to the same student I mentioned before, in fact, yesterday, and she's doing a stats class and she's doing it online and she said it's absolutely perfect. Um, I can just uh, go ahead and get rid of this. I don't, it's not really essential to my cyber security major, um, but I can see the university wants me to know something about statistics. So maybe statistics 101 is a, is a good example. And I'm sure there are many others. There are certainly some questions about students who are underprepared, who don't have the ability to uh, organize themselves, to manage their own time effectively, to where to turn for resources. Perhaps some disadvantaged students may also suffer. It's not particularly cheap. And of course, the students are still missing the, the college experience. And during the, the pandemic, uh, we had all these uh, complaints, uh, which I um, noted in the press and so forth. Uh, basically, the students was, were sort of taking the approach, well, look, I didn't, I didn't sign up for, well, the UK example, I didn't sign up for Open University. That was by one of the students who organised a petition for the universities to refund some of their fees. Uh, and everybody was struggling, at least to some extent, I think, the professors, the students, the advisors, uh, support groups. And of course, that leads to, a, uh, leads to um, uh, frustration with these uh, with what we're offering, and of course, exacerbated by the by the um, pandemic itself, which brought on all sorts of other personal uh, tensions and 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 indeed tragedies, I'm sure, in, in in some cases. So we have, as a as an industry, I want to suggest to you that we have problems at all levels. At a strategic level, we have to be in a position to demonstrate that the student getting the credit is the one doing the work. At a tactical level. Universities are exper experimenting with various pieces of software and camera cameras and honesty pledges and punishments and so forth. But these are very varied and there's lots of ethical questions around the use of some of this uh, technology. There's still uh, a question out, out there that honesty pledges might work in some places but not in others. And operational, right? Instructors are often left to make their own decisions about how to deal with uh, students who may be uh, not or turning in work that is not their own. Uh, some schools require it to be reported, others leave it up to the instructor. Sometimes the instructors get together, but these are all, uh, this, this is a big mess, I think. Um, and we, we certainly need to, uh, as an industry, address this. Well, I want to suggest to you that COVID-19 uh, COVID has, has given us something of an opportunity here. Um, about 2011, a guy called Tom Friedman, writing in the New York Times, uh, suggested that MOOCs, the massive open online courses, were uh, a great opportunity to help people improve living standards, reduce poverty, etc. But over the next 10 years or so, eight to 10 years, it didn't really work. It, it didn't. It didn't have the benefits that uh, we we some of us hoped for early early on. Um, however, COVID is likely to change the way we think about work. Uh, so education may benefit from it too. Uh, there's kind of an ac ac acceptance today that meetings like the one we're having right now uh, are okay, that this is it's certainly better than nothing. And indeed, it may be a lot better than what we might be able to organize in a different way. So if that permeates into the education industry, uh, that, that could be good. But I would like to suggest that what we need to do is really establish a gold standard for education. Uh, and I think that we can do that by addressing these points. Now, it could be, it could be that I've missed a couple here, but I think this is a pretty good starting place. I think we, as far as technology is concerned, we need to think about what is needed, what's acceptable, what's desirable, both in equipment and access. Um, 
is in access, we need to think about things like library resources, course videos, uh, whether we can get those and make them available. Uh, one of the most valued parts, I think, of a student's life at university is the interaction with the professor, particularly in their senior years where they're doing research projects and things. We need to develop ways for this to be brought up to what we are able to experience in the face-to-face -face environment. Ease of use brings up the idea of tech support. Right? We typically have students taking courses in many different time zones. When they do it, students being students, leave things to the last possible minute. Uh, when things fail, as they inevitably will, there's no one to help them. Uh, the professor's not interested or unobtainable. Um, the student becomes frustrated. It, uh, some students follow it through, other students drop out. We need to think about uh, security of the, of the study or the exam uh, taking environment of student work. And we even need to think about the IP of the, of the professor, uh, whether or not that those sorts of uh, courses that we're, that we're putting up online can be easily copied and, and, uh, and shared with uh, people in other, in other environments. Uh, we've, I've already talked about ethics, but I think here it includes things like uh, group work and how we deal with that. Uh, student deliverables, what's expected, uh, how it should be delivered. Uh, affordability, we have to determine whether or not the pricing structure is, is appropriate. Uh, and, and most importantly, perhaps the very last one, efficacy, is we have to build a, what have I written there, acceptable, rigorous, robust learning environment equal to face-to-face -face that will produce the desired outcome. Uh, and I don't think that that's, I don't think that's asking too much, but I do think that it's, uh, it's potentially uh, problematic in, in getting the university administrations around the world to act uh, together on this. But for me, the, if we can salvage anything from the last couple of years, it will be that we've had the opportunity to showcase education, online education to the whole world. Surely we got something right. Surely some of the students appreciated what we were doing. Surely it works for some people. Those are the areas on which we need to capitalize. And I did write this at one point, you know, online education is not for all of the people all of the time. And it may not be for some of the people all of the time, but maybe it's for some of the people some of the time. And maybe it's that 10 or 20% of, or maybe it's even a little higher of people that we can attract here with our, um, with our gold standard, with our new, uh, reliable, robust uh, learning environment. So who are these people? Well, there's, there's at least five uh, groups, I think, um, that uh, I'd like to, to talk about uh, just briefly. And I, I would think we need input from all of these groups. Uh, we need to address things like where students live. And, uh, many American students, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, see going away to, from, to college as a very significant uh, sort of almost like a rite of passage in their getting a wisdom in their in their lives. Uh, it's an opportunity to grow up. It's an opportunity to make new friends. It's an opportunity to live a different life to the one you've lived before. Uh, and if we're going to diminish that in some way by providing online classes, well, that that might be not suitable and might be not wanted for all of the people all of the time. Uh, we certainly have to address the issue of students' ability to cope uh, with time management and being able to sort out their own problems and gather information on their own, uh, which we tend to help them with face to face, but much less so online. And perhaps we might even, as, as we move on through the next decade or so, we might even reevaluate the need for uh, an actual degree itself, perhaps given that um, uh, we have sort of things like just-in-time training and on-the-job training and acquisition of new skills and a vast array of material out there in things like edX and the Khan Academy and so forth that can help you with uh, immediate requirements. Perhaps the actual degree itself is perhaps needs to be re rethought. The university administrators will have to deal with at least technical support, changing the way we teach and perhaps re redesigning uh, the degree offerings. I think that uh, the education ship mid-ocean is going to be very difficult to turn around. But uh, already I've noticed, my, even here where I teach in, in, in New York City, 
uh, I've noticed uh, the management of the university starting to talk about uh, some of some of these things as ways in which we will have to move. Uh, they're not doing it anytime soon, but it might happen over the next five years that we'll see some movement uh, in these directions. Professors will have to work on that student engagement. Standing out the in front of a class of 500 people uh, probably isn't going to promote uh, student engagement unless the student really wants to be there, really has a good reason for, for being there. Look at ways of giving the students experiences to back up the sort of textbook uh, material and the, and, the, and the presentation material. Um, anything that will enable them to see the material uh, in practice and probably some redesign of the courses. You know, I can, I can walk into a lecture hall today and tie up last year's uh, presentation by adding a few words or giving a reference and, you know, I can get by on that. I can't do that with my online classes. The material's out there. If it's out of date, it looks, I can wing it in the classroom is what I'm trying to say. If I try and wing it online, the material's out there. It can be uh, examined in some detail. Uh, it can be criticized. Uh, it can be shown as out of date or irrelevant, etc. Whereas the same thing doesn't really apply in the face-to-face -face environment. I think for the people who provide the, the, the platform providers, there's going to be a lot of competition here as many organizations, not just the learning management systems, but textbook publishers, etc., get into the act. Um, we, we need a way for the people to be able to trans, uh, transfer between them. Uh, I think we need to value the input of the instructor more than the service providers would let us, uh, would let us, or would, or would uh, suggest we perhaps just need to do. Um, I'm not too sure of the value of a course where the students simply go online, take the tests online, have them graded online, um, look up their instructions online and get their results online. Uh, that to me is not really a, a university level or an appropriate course for a university uh, level program. But perhaps the most important area that we need here for the platform providers is to promote or improve the student to student and student professor interaction. And Finally, uh, the government. Um, I think education is recognised as a way out of poverty and and, um, and uh, economic development improves economic development. So uh, this could provide an opportunity for the government to uh, improve the standard of living and so forth in, in various countries. Uh, they will need to provide the infrastructure uh, that will have to be in place. I mean, here in the pandemic in the United States, there were pictures of people sitting in you know Walmart. Uh, Walmart parking lots using the Walmart Wi-Fi to uh, try and access their, their courses. Um, we need uh, incentives to encourage students to take this way and, pro and probably they need to start funding some research on, uh, on what uh, can be done. So how do we get there? Well, I think we can learn from the success stories. I've just picked a couple here, MIT and Georgia Tech. They have very successful online programs that are, that are well regarded. Perhaps we should start by looking at what they are doing, and you can probably point to many more in your own countries that you see as successful. What is it that they have? How can we how can we translate that into something that uh, we might be able to put in as part of our gold standard? We can certainly learn from the MOOCs, right? The the MOOCs of teaching these very large numbers of students what's successful, what works, who does it work on, uh, what what abilities does the student need, etc. We need to involve, of course, the students and their and their um, uh, professors and their parents and anybody who's uh, involved in this. What, what is what is it that they can do, and perhaps um, the uh, government can recognise that perhaps education is uh, very important and uh, try and put some uh, muscle, which could translate into dollars, I suppose, uh, into that. So. I would suggest that a good way to start would be for, for a group to look at some really successful courses running around the world and see what they do that works and what they do that we could perhaps adapt or adopt into our own courses. So thank you for your time. Um, I'd be extremely interested in, in hearing your thoughts. I know that um, many of you have probably experienced exactly the environment that I've uh, discussed here. Um, I, I've written several papers. I think Alex has made a couple of them available to you that sort of uh, go to say go to say somewhat more formally the sorts of things I've said today. 
Uh, I'd be very happy to hear from you or work with you if you have stories or practices to report. I'd be happy to uh, write uh, write something with you or, or work on a project um, to to improve this uh, with you. Um, and I guess my my final thought is, you know, we have this opportunity now where everybody's been suddenly made aware of the possibilities of online education. Um, what uh, let's not let let's not let this opportunity slip. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, uh, it's uh, great to have someone else who really believes on this. Of course, everyone who's in this call uh, believes in, in distance uh, education and remote education or whatever. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so we are sort of a, let's say, biased audience for you. Uh, but I, I still would like to share with you a comment by one of the students. I mean, we have, I've already told you there are researchers here. There are professors, uh, university professors. There are students, graduate students, even some undergrads sneak in uh, sometimes. Uh, but the graduate students, mainly for those uh, or some of them in, in several schools in Latin America, are taking this as a course, the, the, the research seminar series as a course. So they, they get credits. And then, of course, they have to put some work into it. It's not just sitting and watching as if, as, as if it were TV, right? Uh, and so they, mainly for those who are, I mean, everyone is invited, but mainly for those who are students taking this as a course and getting credits, we asked them to participate in a forum where they discuss the papers that were sent to them beforehand. So, so where they, they express their, their sometimes it's, it's a very, uh, it, it's a, a, let's say, a very academic uh, uh, perspective. Sometimes they, they open their hearts and, and they say things uh, like what was said here by uh, Leandro when he says, this is a, and he's talking about one of your, your papers. This is a very humanistic article uh, that I love to read, even that, that the suggestions does not apply for all situations involving teaching in pandemic times, certainly can bring uh, bright ideas and uh, pave useful path to better teaching. Uh, there were several other comments here. Uh, all of them were, uh, uh, or many of, uh, many of them were uh, reinforcing this aspect that the, 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 prof the professor has to be there, the teacher has to be there. Uh, this is remote. It's a remote experience, uh, but people have to I mean, we have to, to be as close to, to the face-to-face -face situation as, as, as we could, right? As we could in the past. Mm. Uh, and, and, and maybe uh, one of the possibilities for, for distance learning in the future is what people have been calling remote. I, I think they are using the, at least here the, in, in, in Brazil, we are using the, the, the expression remote education to, to say it's a little different to what we, we were trying before. Most of uh, uh, the, the online education that we had before was in a more like a MOOC style. So it was more like training. And in the universities, people were sort of uh, averse to them. And they said, well, that's, that's, uh, that's not teaching. That's, 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 uh, that, well, that, that's not educating. That's just uh, training or, or something like that. That was the impression that many professors and even many students had about it. Now that we have sessions like this one, and I, I definitely agree with you that uh, we, we have to think of doing more than simply sitting in front of it. But we, we are interact. We, we, we found out that there, there are other ways of uh, being much more interactive in our, in our let's say, distance education than we were in the past. Uh, so my uh, and, and this was something that uh, some of the, the students remarked here. Uh, Jeff is showing us that the, the, the professor has to be present. The students have to be present. It's still uh, education still needs uh, people engaging with people uh, for, for it to happen. Just wanted to be, before anyone asks their questions, I, I just, because I, I love this comment by, uh, by uh, Leandro here, uh, which was also echoed by some of uh, his colleagues later on. All right, so uh, whoever has questions, just open your mics uh, or, 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 or uh, raise your hands or whatever. Mahi, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Professor Jeffrey. Thank you to, to, to join us, and uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, one of my questions is more related to our contest, to Latin America contest, that uh, I wonder how you deal uh, with, uh, in, in America, during this period that we have been suddenly go online, to especially related to infrastructure and um, you know this this way that 
the connections, you know, in, in especially in our country are not so well. There are regions that we have good connections, but others, even those who are, that we are living in good, uh, in, in, in good regions, and many times we don't have good connections. And, uh, you know, they, they, it, it takes us uh, as an, uh, a situation many times that it's not exactly what happened uh, in, in, in the presidential uh, space. So when we are face to face, of course, we already, we, we also have some problems, the lights gone or, or I don't know, whatever, something happens. And we, I think we manage that, in, in, you know, in, in a, I think perhaps we, we are used to manage this kind of situation, but then in the pandemic, we have to manage in a different way, not only trying to engage our students, but also this, you know, um, infrastructure, um, I would say infrastructure divide, because it's a kind of digital divide that we have some, you know, depending on the group. And, and here, I believe that in this group here, uh, we have students from public university that most of them many of them and, and even in private universities they don't have they're not affordable you know good internet connections and they live in in areas that you know the the, the, the connections are not so good for instance in my university my university is a federal university of rio de janeiro uh, we have i have students in the, in the undergraduation that lives in you know in poor communities so the, the, the university uh, um, supply them with um, some kind of connections uh, Shippy, how we say that? SM. Um, I forgot the name of English. Uh, my guess, Shippy. Um, Shippy. Okay. Yeah, the, tele the telephone. The telephone. Uh, tele yeah. Know, device. Yeah. These kind of things to to get them to uh, allow them to to join the classes and 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 so on. So, you know, you can imagine that we have quite different situations around uh, Latin America. Then uh, we have those. Okay. Hi. You know high uh, opportunities, but on the other side, we have, I think we, we, we should put light on, on this digital divide that we didn't, we, I, I think we, we most of us forget that we have that, but it was there. And now uh, we have to face that in a different way. I don't, it's just a comment, you don't need to answer, of course. It's just my feelings about your talk. Yes, I think it's. I think that's a very valid feeling for sure. And it's. Uh, look, I can assure you, it's not limited to Latin America. Uh, but some, a couple of the things that uh, that I've sort of noticed that might be partly relevant is one is is. I know this sounds silly, but or simple, but you know, keep the the file sizes small. Uh, if they've got it, if they've got to try and download a narrated PowerPoint that's over their dodgy on, to try and read on the over their dodgy connection. Um, you don't need to include video, you don't need to include the highest quality, make it as easy for them as you can. The other thing which is which is sort of relevant, I think, although clearly the technical issue does, does, does have to be overcome, is if the student is enthusiastic about what he or she is studying and wants to be there, they will try harder. Whereas the student who is perhaps less enthusiastic or more frustrated or whatever, they'll have one attempt at it, maybe two, and then they won't bother it. Rather, they'll simply say I couldn't get the presentation and, and give up. Uh, so if, if we've been able to establish an environment where they feel welcome and feel that they're gaining something from it, that might help as well. But you're quite right. Uh, the I mean, the, the problem here existed. New York came up with this bright, bright idea uh, two weeks after the, after the university closed. They uh, did a deal with all the libraries across New York City so the students could go into the libraries. And then about a week later, the libraries all closed. So <laughs> that didn't work. But you're, you're quite right. It's, 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 it's a problem. And it's, it's more than just a connection. I mean, uh, I sit at home with my high speed internet connection and my, you know, my uh, two year old laptop. Um, and uh, some of my students perhaps are competing with their sister and their brother and their mother and their father who are for an hour or two on the household PC sometime. Uh, so it's, that's certainly going to be a problem for us, yes. But keep it small, keep it available, uh, make the, make the, make the uh, essential information available in a small format as you can, I think. Thank you, Professor. I, I think this is, the, this is the, the big challenge that we have because most most of us of uh, our the professors we we have laptops and so on and when we see the, the i think it was a, a shock that we we have 
we have to face when uh, most of our students were in, in their smartphones that were not so good. Most of them are, you know, low quality of uh, smartphones. Mm -hmm. So they, we were preparing, uh, you know, PowerPoints, blah, blah, blah. And of course, they couldn't see that uh, clearly in, in their yes. phones. And then we have to re rethink the activities, rethink everything. And if we want to uh, send something to them to, to read, for instance, uh, in, in a, even if in advance, uh, it's not so easy to read in a phone as we, if we are reading sure. in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a computer. Right. So, you know, we, it, it was um, quite difficult to make this, you know, this, um, this change. But at the same time, uh, I think it, it gave us light from something that we didn't see before. Because many times, even in the presentation, the face-to-face -face courses, we, we ask them to read something and we send by email or we send in, in our um, uh, Moodle, you know, this, this kind of platforms. And it's not easy to access these platforms in, in a phone. And then perhaps probably we didn't realize that before. So I, I think it brings some, some lights, this period to, to rethink what we're going to do even if we're returning to the face-to-face -face courses, how we have to change our mind, our methodology, our interaction, and so on. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you very much. I don't want to take more time here. Uh, Violeta had said something about uh, only a few of the students participating in online uh, courses. And, and I actually had that experience this morning when I asked my undergrads to open their cameras. I keep telling them, please open your cameras because I. I want to see you. you. You need to see me, but I also want to see you. Uh, of course, uh, being it possible. And then I, I, it took 30 seconds and not even my most enthusiastic student had opened his camera. And then I said, not even Andreas is going to open his camera. And then he suddenly opened it and some others started. But it is a, a, a challenge. Some uh, students show a lot more enthusiasm than others. Uh, for, for this kind of, uh, of uh, let's say, media. Uh, and, and I understand that this is why uh, Jeff thinks that when we plan this for the future, it, it, it will be, what is it uh, that you said, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, for, for some at some time? Oh, some, of the, some of the people, yeah, I hope that it'll be for some of the people some of the time. And I hope the sum is large, but we certainly are not going to be talking about all the people all the time or even all the classes for some people. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's just some of the people some of the time. I don't know if, uh, if uh, uh, Violeta wants to compliment on that. Yeah, she, 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 she. Go on, Violeta. <laughs> yeah, no, also, I think, especially during this period, all of us, we had a, an overload of things to watch. I think that, that that was a problem because even when we wanted to do more things, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't stop to see the screen because we were so tired. You know, it's like when we, we leave the classes for students to watch later, I, I'm quite sure that 90% of the students won't, won't, you know, watch the classes because they have so many other things and also social networks as well. Yes, they spend so much time on social networks that when they have to, you know, stop and watch 40 minutes of class, they, they just don't have enough patience. And also even uh, when they are attending the class online, I, I'm sure that about 80% they are doing something else answering WhatsApp, it's very hard to keep attention just on the screen and only on one activity. Yeah, we are multitask and when we are online, we're very multitask. So, and uh, usually we say that um, uh, uh, that physics is not the same anymore because you can be at, at three places at the same time. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah. the problem is that we don't uh, really pay attention in any of them. <laughs> Well, Violetta, perhaps I shouldn't admit this, but uh, yesterday in this very room, I was engaged in a WebEx uh, school meeting, a department meeting. And like all department meetings, it dragged on and on and on and people kept talking and about nothing. And so I thought I've got a really great opportunity here to uh, do something else. So I, I put myself on to uh, shut down the video and uh, did something else. I can't remember what it was now, but yeah, I, I'm sure we take advantage of that. And I'm sure the students do too. But if students are good at selecting what they have to do and what they shouldn't do, maybe it's this may be even to their profit, right? It could uh, be, that's right. But, well, <laughs> this, I think this is part of the problem, Alex. I think the good students can do that. Uh, they can tune out because they're okay with that bit uh, and they'll come back and they'll know when they need to be there and they'll know what they need to submit and they'll be able to talk. The poorer students tune out and then forget about it. 
uh, and then and that's a, that's a problem, I think. Uh, but then that's probably the same way, you know, in life, in, in some ways. Right. We also had some people commenting here in the chat about, of, of course, the, the accessibility problem. But after you told us uh, that even in the States, uh, some of the students go to Walmart to sort of try and steal their bandwidth and, <laughs> and use that to, to get access to their to their workload. Uh, I think that's what's happening in Bolivia or here in Brazil is, is just about the same. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Maybe in different sure. levels, but, but just uh, uh, what we'll have to consider always is that not all students will be able to use uh, technology the same way. And, and that's, uh, for example, when, when I tell, when I ask my students to open their cameras, uh, I, I do that being very aware that some of them will not be able to, and, and, and we should try not to force them because many times they don't even, even have bandwidth to do that. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. I mean, if, even for, for us, right? I live in Tennessee, I live in Murfreesboro. Five miles out of Murfreesboro is kind of the rural areas. There are some places they don't even have internet period. Mm -hmm. So that discrepancy between urban versus rural, it's also affecting students. So the location, um, so again, it's, it's not just you guys, it's, it's everywhere. Like even for the Middle East, for instance, in Lebanon, mm -hmm. uh, it's not just the internet, it is the power, electricity itself. So the government supported electricity, Lebanese can have it only like four hours a day. The other hours, they don't even have anything to lit. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just the Internet that is something more basic, more than that. Yeah, you're quite right. I, I mean, I'm always amazed driving around the United States. You know, my phone doesn't work. Uh, we're in we're in Vermont and New Hampshire. We went to see the fall leaves, which were unbelievably spectacular for those of you who have never seen them. Uh, but just driving around between quite big towns, um, sometimes there, you know, there was just no reception. Uh, on my phone, and I find this quite extraordinary that there's large these large tracts of tracts of, of land in America where the where the where the internet doesn't shine, so to speak. All right. Any other questions? Just raise your hands, or or just start talking. Open your mics. Pepe. Oh, Pepe just turned turned on his uh, camera there, and and I thought that he had a question. But... No, he's just pretending that he's he, he's he's in, in another meeting alongside. He's he's doing he's, he's doing your trick, you know, Jeff. Yeah, right. He was there talking actually, to the dean, talking to I'm the sorry. dean, and <laughs> I'm not, I, I actually I don't know why why you still call me Pepe because I I, I actually don't don't answer to to, to Pepe because it's, I'm not used to it. Uh, I I, always, I either go by Jose or Jose Antonio. Sorry about that. But anyways, I I actually do have some uh, some uh, I, I don't know if it's a question or or um, asking you, Geoff, to um, give us some advice. Uh, and actually, we, we do have students here, so I, I would also like to hear from them. I, I think that that will also be great. But myself, as, a, as an instructor, I always struggle with it. And, and I have to be honest, I, I don't think this is a problem just because we are doing a lot of stuff online. This was already a problem before we were forced to, to do this online. And it's about reading, reading and a little bit of studying before, before classes, which, which is really, really helpful. That really enhances when, when students read, even if they cannot finish all the readings, but when students can read, actually we have a much better class. However, what it's happening is I, it's more and more difficult to find students who come to class prepared for for, for for the class so i don't know if you have any any suggestion and what what have you seen uh Joe? well i don't know that this is the perfect answer right but uh, certainly one of the things that i do is that i reserve a small percentage of the grade in the course probably up to about 10 percent uh, for a series of quizzes that they have to take before they come to class so if we are looking at say chapter three tonight in my security class, there will be a chapter quiz on that, and they get they get graded in their chapter quiz. And if they take it before they get, if they take all of them before they get to class, they get ten points out of a hundred. So most of them at least take the chapter quiz. So that means that they've at least had to look at their chapter. I also do something similar if I'm setting a specific reading, perhaps an article out of a magazine or a journal paper or something, uh, for them to read, or I gave them doesn't matter anyway, an article to, to read. And I, I had a little five point sort of question 
about that that article and that was that was some weeks ago but that's the same thing so they, they get another benefit from this too I, I sometimes use those chapter quizzes as the database for the uh, for the midterm or the final so they might get 10 or 15 questions out of those questions appearing in in their final uh, so that's another incentive to make sure they that they get good marks or complete those but my yeah my real objective there is is what you're suggesting I think is to get them to at least think about the material before they come to class so that's I think I'm I'm fairly unusual in doing that because most times when I tell the students what's happening they're quite surprised by this but it seems to work well for me so you could you could give that a try and see uh, Alex there was a question in the in the chat I think yeah there, 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 there's this one that I saw there uh, by Fernando Zanesco. Fernando yeah yeah, Fernando's question is, and maybe I'm not sure if, if any uh, of us here has experience with that, but he, he's concerned about the classes that also involve laboratory practices. Uh, uh, and, and of course, that requires students to, to I mean, to go to, to, to a place where that lab is physically uh, set for, for, for their work. Uh, and then uh, they say, is there a way to work around that? I don't know. I don't know if. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do not have any direct experience there. Um, but I do know that my colleagues in the in the cybersecurity program here where I teach uh, have had a lot of difficulty trying to set labs up. They have very, very good labs on campus, uh, but, but what they've um, been able to do um, to, to, to let students do that online really hasn't worked very well. Uh, well, I don't, I, that's my understanding at least. Um, the, the, it's changed a little bit now because, and it changed last, in fact, the semester before this one when the university was partially open. So what the university did was uh, persuade the uh, instructors to run the lab two or three times, but for a third of the students at a time. Uh, but you're right, it's, it's, it's problematic. And, and typically the students sit around in a fairly small group and, and that just wasn't possible in, in, the, uh, in the pandemic. But I think that that is an issue. And of course, we're probably lucky when you consider something like, I don't know, you know, designing clothes or uh, or uh, physics experiments or whatever, uh, it's going to be it's going to be even more uh, difficult. You can some of it can be sort of perhaps replicated in a in a paper or a video or whatever, but it's not the same as doing it yourself. You know, uh, Jeff, just going back to what uh, uh, Jose was uh, was saying about this difficulty of having the the students read bef beforehand. Uh, my, my impression, and now again, of course, each one of us is talking about their own experience here. But my impression was that this worked better during the pandemic than before, mm -hmm. because uh, well, the students uh, had to come to class having already read the chapter, the chapter or the papers that were assigned to them. And, and it was more difficult for them, I, I had the impression, more difficult for, for them to, to hide in an online class than when there are 50 students in a, a normal classroom. And besides, what I tried to started doing with my undergraduate students, I always had quizzes at the beginning of the class uh, related to the, to, to the topic that they should have read before coming to class. Yeah, same thing as what I was saying, yes. Yeah, and, and those quizzes, are, are, I mean, and I'm talking here about Kahoot and things like that, or Mentimeter, you know, Kahoot, is, Kahoot was great to just have a very quick uh, assessment of what they had or if they had learned or, or not. Uh, and then I'll, I'll just say that I, 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 for, for me, and of course, each one of us will have to find what works for themselves, at least for now. Uh, one of the problems that I have with a 50 student undergraduate class is that I, I didn't know how to access, uh, assess their work at the, at the end of the semester. So you know what I do now? Oral exam. Each one of them has 15 minutes to prove to me that they learned something during the semester. Uh, at the, the end of the course, but that only, and then you, you think 50 students, 15 minutes, it's, 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 it's a whole week, right? <laughs> no, what I do is, well, every, uh, they're all being tested using the, using Kahoot, right? 15 questions at the beginning of a class, Kahoot, uh, and those that uh, do well during the whole semester, I say, you're, you're, you're out, you, you don't have to take the, the oral exam unless you're not satisfied with your, whatever grade you have. Yeah. And then, of course, they're all satisfied with, with the grade that I already have. And then I only keep there. Uh, I only have to to have the oral exam uh, 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 given to maybe a third of the class. Some of them that don't, don't even show up because they are the ones who actually didn't do anything and realize that they would not survive uh, an oral exam. And the others uh, sometimes even surprise me because uh, they were students that, that couldn't be there in in class in real time, but were were benefiting from the fact that we were recording our classes and they were watching them on weekends or whatever. And when they came to the oral test, which I thought 
was was going to be something really scary and that people would want to get rid of they were well prepared for that so my impression uh, of course for for classes for, for courses that have the the characteristics of you know very, very classes that tend to be lectures usually i thought that they became more we discussed more because they they, they actually learned they, they read the papers before uh and uh i, I by myself i'm i'm really uh, I became really enthusiastic about this possibility and i i want to keep it afterwards if of course if i have good bandwidth in my regular normal class whatever we call normal i will have my my face-to-face -face students and i will always have my remote students because i think that they do just as well it may be just a part part of them not all of them but but uh, i i in that sense uh jose i i had a a, a good experience here mm -hmm. and i even have some some so of course the students of mine were were here in this class they're they graduate students right so they didn't have to go through Kahoot uh, every class. Uh, we, we trust graduate students a little better than that. But they also had to do all the reading beforehand. Uh, and I think I, I, I do not think that it was that they that their experience in that sense was worse than any 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 of the experience that other students had before the pandemic. The problem is I think a huge problem is and, and you mentioned that networking, uh, the experience with the university, having in the university environment, the uh, you know doing more things with. The, the professors and the colleagues that they, they they do during the time that they are they're they gather together for for an online class but the class itself uh, seems to work okay. mm -hmm. yeah still still the problem because I, I actually do those those quizzes before before the class and actually my experience is basically with uh graduate students but they still don't read they they somehow I mean I guess they guess the the, the answers. In, um not, not all of them there is there is there is always some unfortunately not even half that 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 still don't don't read or at least don't don't fully read so so anyways I, I guess we will have to keep searching I, what one one new thing that I that I um, found as a um, as a as an advice for 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 especially for online classes is to have short readings instead of long readings and probably that yes. that will be my problem that i do have long readings instead of, of the short ones yes well Mahi has her hands on and, and yeah. in addition to that it would be good for us to hear some of the impressions of the students afterwards if yeah. anyone wants to to talk on their behalf and say how, how did you feel during the pandemic uh, time and, and being in a graduate school but before uh, Mahi, go on okay yeah one, one of my reflections here about this uh discussion is um how we are going to deal with the when we come back to class uh, i know that we, it will be gradually uh, 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 back to class uh, and a presential class and uh because there are several tools that like you mentioned here that were very useful for us for us and for, for the students as well and uh perhaps we have to like in the same way that we we, we turn to the the, the online classes uh, we have now to turn off <laughs> again and to learn how to do that again uh, after this experience that we have in the last almost two years. So probably we are going to have different type of classes that we have before the pandemic. And now uh, we have to, to, to learn or to, to create a new way, like an hybrid, but I don't mean hybrid uh, like half the class uh, online and half. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the lady, my boss. I'm so sorry, uh, everybody. <laughs> I will call her. Uh, well, so um, I forgot that. So I, I think we have to 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 reflect how we is going to be this return to the normal class that will be not exactly normal because we have this periods of learning how to teach and to study um, on, on, uh, online. So that was just on my, one of my reflections. Now. Yeah, I think that's true. But it's, yeah, I, I think it, it would be nice to listen to some of our students. But Andrea has her hands up. Yeah. He's one of the students. Yeah. So hello. Hi, Professor Jeff. Thank you very much for your talk and your papers it was very inspiring for me because i'm both a teacher and a student however i'm nowadays i'm more of a student so um i really enjoyed everything you you wrote and you shared so 
uh, generously with everyone. And I think that uh, those papers should be should be available to everyone's community who are, uh, that are, are 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 present here because there are many improvements that have to be done. But uh, I think that the main problem, at least for a master student, and I share this with my my colleagues, is the amount of reading. And sometimes we even think, I mean, are these, are those 350 pages really useful and really relevant to the topic of a two hour class? I mean, is it really necessary? I mean, it's very uh, stressful for us to read it. It's too much. We don't think it's really useful. Um, and I think if, if the teacher or the professor could upload I don't know, 50 pages or 30 pages, the student may feel more, um, how can I say, more prone to reading it than if if they see their 350 pages, for example. So um, I think that the, the amount of pages when we we access the PDF, it's really, it really, it either invites you to read it or it refrains you from reading. So I think that's it. I don't know. <laughs> that's 350, just my, my... 350 pages does sound like a lot. Um, yeah. I mean, when I, we, we do like three disciplines or four, we easily have 300 pages to read a week. Yeah, for a week. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, part of my approach to the sort of making the course relevant, I try to use material from say magazines like the Economist or the CIO magazine or the New York Times uh, that tend to, to, to illustrate the day-to-day -day practical application of the sorts of things we're talking about. For example, I might have them read an article on, on, a, on a hacking event or whatever in terms of the security course that I teach. Um, I, I hesitate to push them down the journal, particularly the undergraduates, down the journal uh, down the journal list because they, they are difficult to read even even for, for a native you know speaker of the language in which the journal is written uh, but that that does seem quite a lot um, perhaps we could look at uh, providing some form of summary or the students reading them and, and providing a summary I'm not I'm not sure what's what we're trying to achieve you there. know you know what is happening there Jeff uh, Andrea has still not learned that there I mean although the professors asked them to read 300 pages they have to figure out which which what, what part of that is really important and what part is not so important. <laughs> no, but I, I think true. this is a work. For, I mean, the teacher should, I mean, guide us in in finding this way because we are learning. I mean, we don't know, you know, so we and trust the teachers. Sort of, what sort of documents are you reading? Well, um, or textbooks or no. I mean, my my professors, most of them give uh, uh, chapters from books, uh, scientific papers, a lot of scientific papers. And I would love to, uh, for example, watch a video, a film, reading a newspaper article, you know, like you do. I think this is brilliant. We could do, we could do like, uh, we could read two academic papers, let's say, and watch a film, a movie, a documentary, or an article from New York Times. This would be brilliant, I think. One of the things I presume you've already been told this, and I'm teaching you how to suck eggs. But uh, you know, typically, you really most times in those scientific papers, you really only need to read the beginning and the end, you know, <laughs> what what they're doing, why they're doing it, and then the results. And then you, you're probably not that interested in how they went about it, unless you're going to critique their their methodology in some way. So maybe maybe a an approach is to read the you know the introduction, why we're doing something and then the results nice. and see if that's enough. Yeah, that's true. Thank you for the tip. <laughs> Tell me if that's... it works now, OK? Uh, uh, okay. We, usually, we, we usually expect that they only learn that tip after they have graduated, Jeff. Well, so <laughs> Alexandre, 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 for me, he has a, a very, a very nice approach because he told us to read the beginning and the end. Like last year, the very first classes, he told this. But our quantitative methods teacher, he doesn't do like that. And the qualitative teachers as well, they tell us to read everything and they ask, they inquire. We have to write uh, his name, as I don't know how to say in English. It's almost like abstract or yeah, summary. Uh, yeah. Summary, yeah, okay. But thank you. That's a very useful tip. I'll cool. share with my colleagues. Give it a try. You I'll, I'll do it. Thank it you. It doesn't work, okay? 
<laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else, any other student or, or graduate student wants to share? Donna, Donna, Donna is a professor in Panama. Uh, so I don't know if she's showing there because she wants to ask a question. You're muted, Donna. Hi, hi. I, I wrote in the comments. Uh, oh, sorry. I had to ask, but um, I'm going to say it right now. No? One of my difficulties that is that the students, we don't know if they are listening to you because the only thing is the little signature of that that says that they are they might be there but you don't know what is the um the scope of what you are telling them if they are receiving this if they are understanding what you're saying and like they don't comment they don't open mic they don't open a uh, video you don't know so um it's a little frustrating it's like i'm talking to myself but i hear how you use this as like um doing ex um previous information so at least they come and say something like alex i use kahoot i use mendis i use um linoid i use anything that i can find to have a way to get them to connect with the with the knowledge and connect with each other i do anything so i like what you are we we're talking about and i think it's um it's very important and this pandemic has been um, a lecture for us because when you are presential, you don't know what they are doing. You're, they might be there, but you don't know they're listening either. So this experience yeah. in the um, pandemic, I think it was um, very important. Yes, uh, look, I sympathize. And I really don't know that they're listening either. I haven't resorted to sort of little uh, in, in, in presentation tests uh, like Alex was talking about. But I, w I will say that um, I, I'm currently teaching a class in, in Mexico, in one of the schools in Mexico. I'm, I'm teaching an a, a online class there uh, for an international program. Uh, and we meet on Monday nights. But I, And I have the same problem that you were outlining, that the students don't turn on their videos, don't turn on their mics, etc. cetera. Um, but, but I'll often stop and say, Donna, would you like to comment on that, or would, uh, would, or um, so and so, would, could you give me an example of that? And they always seem to respond pretty quickly. So I'm assuming that they've got some sort of mechanism set up to at least alert them when their name is is called or whatever. So I'm I'm not sure. Uh, it may be it may be worse. It may, you're right. It's when you're talking away, and you know I even experienced it before because you, I guess you all had your microphones on mute. I couldn't see the faces because my screen, I've only got one screen on this uh, on this laptop here that I'm using. Um, and I, so I couldn't see the faces, but I'm, I'm, and I'm talking away and talking away and talking away. And I'm thinking, I hope someone's still there. Uh, but yeah. Vince, Vince, if I just sent you a WhatsApp message telling you, hey, our connection went down 15 minutes yeah. ago. Yeah. <laughs> you say, oh, no, I was talking on my own. <laughs> I've been talking for 20 minutes. Yeah, that's right. So it may not be as bad as you think, Donna. You know this this thing of having uh, seeing someone. I think it's very important. At least for me, I I cannot do what Jeff was doing. If you, I need to see at least one person in front of me, even if I if I'm talking, if I have my slides here or whatever. So uh, I either need a second monitor or I need to do uh, some uh, screen splitting or something. Uh, use some trick here so that at least I, I have I need at least one hand nodding at what I'm saying or maybe. Yeah. You know, contradicting me, but but I need that. <laughs> you, you know, Donna or Alex, when I I, I think that the, I was thinking about this the other night when I run the, that course again in Mexico, which won't be till this time next year, uh, but I'm going to make it a condition of joining the class that you have your mic, you have your mic, your um, video camera on. Um, they they none of them seem to be having problems with internet connections, so. I, and, and that's that's acceptable. If somebody has a real problem one night or one day, that's fine. But uh, as a, I think I'm going to make it a condition of joining the class, which will be interesting, seeing it's a required class for them. So we'll see. In, any other students want, uh, uh, that could give us uh, your impression? Maybe the graduate students that are uh, that have taken classes in a regular format and that are now taking classes uh, online. Uh, tell me, just to tell us. Uh, what the, what differences that you 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 find there and yeah what's your experience Silvio. if i if i can add just a yeah. little a little 
bit more. Um, I think there is a big difference between the uh, graduate students and the undergraduate students as well in terms of um, committing to studying and to the classes and everything. Yes, very much it's so. a, yeah, it's a matter of maturity, right? I mean, we are 45, 50, 35 years old. We are not 18 anymore or 20 anymore. Um, another thing is what uh, Professor uh, Jeff wrote is about the human connection you are committed to build with your students, the rapport. I think this is so important. If you call the students by their names, if you are interested in what they do, if you talk to them, if you listen to them, I think uh, if we feel heard and we feel respected and we feel acknowledged, by the teacher, uh, we are much more um, inclined to, to, to engage in the class and because engaging in the class is always a matter of respecting the teacher and valuing all the hard work he's, he's, he's uh, doing. And it, it, it has to be uh, uma via de mão dupla, I don't know how to say that, a two-way road, like. Okay, yeah. You're in Germany, Andrea, right? No, no, no. That's my my company's name. I have a, a oh. German surname, but I'm in, in Curitiba, in Brazil. Oh, oh okay. That's my consultancy agency's name, Berlin. <laughs> Anyone else wants to? Yeah, Alexander, you come. Yeah. I am doing a comment, okay. Professor, uh, Professor Jeffries, thank you for the... the explanation now i would like to comment about the content for me uh, as a student it's very important to to show some things in a real life you you write in your paper and uh, to bring some content from new york times the economies is very important even and especially in online classes because it's doing a bridge between the theory and the real situation uh, i think the points for me that's very important as a student and as a professor. One of the things, Silvio, that I've started doing here, and I took the idea from a colleague here, so it's not my idea, but she ran a segment called X, whatever X is, in the news. Uh, and she, let's say it's, uh, when I was teaching it or teaching class, I called it, say, security in the news or information technology in the news or disruptive technologies in the news or something like that. And I asked them to find a news item. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a newspaper, but something that's been uh, in, in the news that people are talking about, uh, that are this kind of a topical comment or topical paper and present that to the class. Uh, and that, uh, they do a small segment each, you know, just five minutes or so that they came across this and here's the, here's the background, here's how it relates to the course, here's why it's interesting that sort of thing. And so my objective there is to try and show the practicality of the textbook uh, material. So that can be a useful way too, I've found, of, of getting uh, students to think about the, the, the uh, course materials in, in practice. Very good, Professor. This point is um, very Alex, good. it's a quarter of five here. I, I have a class of five. Oh, so sorry. That's all right. I'm not sure if anyone has any. I should, but I should probably finish up in five minutes or so. Yeah, there, there, maybe there's a, a last. Uh, there's a last question by An Angel Garcia here. It's it's in the chat. Uh, he says, which of the methodologies to engage and uh, 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 to engage the students uh, so that they learn uh, has given uh, them the best results? Uh, I quite agree on the human connection. Uh, I don't know if you can. Maybe, maybe you can use that just to sum up uh, your ideas. And, and then, and then leave for your classroom because there are other people here who, who also leave to for a classroom at six. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, look, I actually think it's the I think of the of all of the things that I uh, suggested there earlier on. I, I think that if I had to pick one, I would probably pick communication. Uh, the idea of the student being able to contact you. Uh, when and if the student uh, needs to. Uh, I, I follow the practice of usually giving the students my cell phone number. Uh, I tell them to, if they want, to, if they have a problem, they should think about the problem for a couple of minutes. And if it's still a problem, it's a significant problem, they should send me a text message or call. Uh, 
And I, you know, look, I have never had that abused in, in probably 20 years of doing that. Um, the, and it's only rarely been used. Uh, but I think the, the idea that the, that the student is, that the professor uh, has, has made an avenue open for the students to contact them if they need to. So that, you know, I don't want a phone call at midnight saying I've just missed the deadline for the turning in the assignment. I tell them not to make those sorts of calls. But if they're sick, if there's a problem, if there's uh, if they can't, really can't do something, they'll send me a text message. I'll usually respond and get and tell them I'll get back to them the next day. But I think it's the the idea of of communication, being able to talk to the students, uh, being able to understand whether where the students are facing problems. Uh, and their ability to talk to you about that. I think if I had to pick one, I'd probably pick that. In Latin America, Jeff, uh, what's up does the trick. Uh, I know that in the States, not everyone uses that, but over here, uh, WhatsApp is a means of communication and you can set a WhatsApp group just for your class. And, and maybe when we're online, that even helps if by any chance you're right about to get into class and your, your, your computer resets, right? So it will take right. five minutes for it to reboot. You, you send the students a WhatsApp message in that group and say, we are a few minutes late and you know that they will be there waiting for you and they, 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 they haven't gone away. Or, and the same thing that they can respond to you through there. Yeah, yes, I've, I've, never, I've never used that, but I, but I do know that my class in Mexico has such a group set up for themselves. Mm -hmm. They go through as a cohort, this, this group, they, they take each class the same. It's, some, it's a program like that. And they have that. Um, I didn't join it, but I, uh, I, I mean, it wasn't something that I thought I needed to join. Um, but uh, I, I'm aware that some people do that. And they're usually very respectful also. I mean, there are people that spend their whole day in WhatsApp uh, exchanging messages, but they don't do that in these groups because we already set the rules from the beginning, right? And tell them right. that. Uh, yeah. Yes, right. that would be good. Well, knowing, no, knowing that, sorry, my, 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 my setup is sort of collapsing here. <laughs> uh, well, the Jeff has to live very... Yeah. Pardon, pardon, uh, um, I, I just wanted to add for my class, I use uh, Slack, it works. For me, as part of engagement um, and to encourage them to attend, actually, I tell them, feel free to change your background. And it was like magic. Every every time we meet, like they put whatever background they want. This is how they are encouraged to turn on their cameras. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing that I'm using is uh, we have a Google Doc for every session uh, that they put the notes and they can post on the Google Doc any part that they did not understand. This is also a part of, um, you know, engagement, interaction, and, and that sort of, uh, you know, exchange, even between the students themselves. This is right. what I use in my class. Right. Well, that's, I've never used Slack, but I do know that some of my colleagues do. Yeah, it's, 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 it's another good alternative for that. Well, uh, Jeff, we don't want to, to get you too close to, your, to, to your, the time of your next class, so you need at least two minutes to take a breath, right? Well, I need I five minutes to walk across the courtyard. So. All right. And drink water. All right. And drink water. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for 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 all your uh, your ideas. Uh, they're they're much appreciated. Uh, they they definitely help us all balance our own ideas on on, on how to deal with uh, this in the future. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone: next week we will have a session on co-creation uh, with Sandra Balbino from the Université du Québec au Montréal. Uh, she will be talking about uh, the situation where uh, or when customers become the producers and marketers uh, of uh, the products that. They, they, they consume themselves. So see you all then. Uh, thank you very much again, Jeff, and see you all next week. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Alex. Bye, everybody. Yeah.